So it's my pleasure and my honor today to talk to you about Google's quantum computing service. This is uh, really a collection of uh, an entire team's worth of effort and work, and it's my honor to share that with you today. So yes, we are building a quantum computing service. Um, and I think as you all may be experienced, uh, what we had some really great dance music there at the interlude. When we pipe that into the lab, we get some really nice results with uh, folks uh, at Google. We try to think about uh, doing things at 10x scale. And here I tried to show you uh, at 10x speed what it looks like to install a couple of our systems into the quantum data center. Uh, so you get some kind of feel for what it's like when we have great dance music, great, uh, <laughs> great engineers and scientists putting everything together to put together our quantum data center. But of course, when we started to, uh, this project and we were in the shell of the building and looking at these stands, these frames for our cryostats, we had to answer this question of why we were actually building this quantum service. And of course, you all came to mind. Uh, this is a service for you to provide remote access to Google's quantum computer. And I love this image here at the left that kind of illustrates uh, almost like a pit stop with all of the people that are involved to uh, make these systems hum. So, you know, we've got quantum mechanics here on board. We've got from our fab, our fab engineers making the devices through our research scientists and hardware engineers building out these systems to the top of the stack where our software engineers are making sure that everything is well calibrated. And I love this, uh, this, this, uh, this, my colleague here, Andrew, actually poising up to start taking data and has actually offered a seat next to him to take data. In a lot of ways, we're inviting you to come sit down next to us so you too can take data on our systems. Um, so the idea being that you will be able to perform these classically intractable experiments. More people like you means more innovation and together we expect to have you know, some great NIST discovery of impact. And just to kind of codify that into our mission behind this quantum computing service, really we're out here to make the best in class quantum computing tools available to you all ultimately to enable humankind to solve problems that would otherwise be impossible. And our practice here is to take this research platform that we've built and expand that, extend it to you all, our collaborators, so that you can use CERC to call the Quantum Engine API to access Google's quantum computing service and run jobs on our hardware, the Sycamore processors. So what have we built? Well, I like to think that we've built quantum computers for NISC exploration. Um, hopefully you think of this maybe as the quantum computer for your NIST discovery. This is an actual image of one of our devices cold in the quantum data center today. Um, and I thought I'd give you kind of the schematic view of that system. So the bill of materials, all the work that we've had to do to take to put this together so that you can actually touch down to that hardware. So with the view on the left, kind of schematically, of course, the very base of this, the mix plate, we have our quantum processors, so our Sycamore processor. But we package and put into a mount and put that into the dilution refrigerator with you know numbers of uh, wiring attenuators and amplifiers, all these things that go into the dilution refrigerator that we've vetted over the years, picking the right materials and making over you know 10,000 connections to actually make the uh, connection down to the device. Um, here we have an image of my colleague Brooks Foxen, elated to have the control hardware all wired up to the device, um, and then. Uh, we complete everything with the kind of room temperature uh, calibrations here with, uh, with Ted White, very excited to, to be at that final step before we put the cans on and actually cool down to make sure that we've actually got everything calibrated. At this point, we're looking at you know, nearly 10,000 components in these systems. And I should note that every line that comes down to the device is an analog line, whether that's a control or readout line. And ultimately, the, through these calibrations, we're trying to get that transfer function to basically unify all of those lines to look very similar to one another. And of course, I'm really proud and very excited about the progress we're making on our quantum data center. And here we are uh, showing just steps away from actually being able to deploy even more of these Sycamore systems into that space. So what kind of out of the box performance can we expect from these devices today? We've put together this uh, data sheet here for you to, uh, as, the, as kind of a, anyone who's going to sit down as the NISC algorithm designer using CERC, uh, looking at the relevant metrics to gain some kind of intuition of what uh, you would expect the device. Uh, so in this case, we started with our fish food uh, experiments with 23 qubits, uh, 23 qubit grid on a Sycamore architecture, so-called rainbow processor in the rainbow cryostat. Um, and what we've done is we try to compile the things here you would nicely be able to just kind of get a glimpse at, oh yeah, get some intuition of what's going on. If you were paying attention, I just grew the grid from 23 to 51. 
And you notice that that integrated histogram that we have at the bottom, which is just kind of a nice picture of what's happening on the device, uh, didn't change much. Uh, to our delight, you know, these single qubit errors were basically right on top of each other. And we were able to keep the same performance as we grew the grid. So uh, there's a couple things to note is that we have uh, in our gate set today, uh, we have you know, arbitrary rotations about X, Y, and Z. An important gate, this idle gate called the weight gate. Um, we've added the square root of I swap in addition to the sycamore gate and the CZ gate is forthcoming. So let's dive into a few more of the details of these uh, um, errors here. So for our single qubit errors, uh, what I plot here is our isolated single qubit randomized benchmarking data. So there's a heat map to the right just to kind of give you some idea of what's happening across the device. On the x-axis is error. And then, of course, we're just taking and integrating over all of the qubits in the grid. And the big takeaway here is that for the 51 qubit grid and the 23 qubit grid, we see essentially the same thing. They're right on top of each other. The single qubit gate errors are equivalent. This is really great news. For our two qubit gates, uh, we took representative data here for the square root of I swap. And again, we have the heat maps over to the right uh, in set to give you some idea of what the grid is looking like across the system. Um, and what's important here is let's look at the dotted lines, which are the 23 qubit grid in green, and the solid green line for the 51 qubit. In this case, what we have for the isolated case of this cross entropy benchmarking um, experiment, these are basically right on top of each other as well. And of course, the work in progress is to make sure that we also have the same performance in parallel, which is what we're working on as we open up to the private EAP. And I would like to make the, the really, this is delightful to see that simultaneous readout across the device does not degrade as we grow from a 23 qubit grid to 51 qubits. Uh, this is a lot of work under the hood here. Uh, so okay, so-called kind of correlated IQs to make sure that we have uh, the same kind of performance. So on this plot, again, we were just plotting error in the x-axis and we have the simultaneous readout, uh, readout errors for the first state, uh, discriminating the excited state, and on the left in blue, discriminating the zero state. And a note on repetition, I think this is an important thing to consider here for um, the perspective of the user. If you step onto the machine and you just kind of naively start sending programs to the machine, you might expect to see something like two kilohertz rep rate. We'd like to encourage you to use these tools that we've built that actually see these really huge gains. Uh, so by batching those programs, we can you know, quadruple the rep rate. And then by adding sweeps, we almost see another doubling. Um, and from the you know, service perspective, we look at this as that we've almost at this point um, you know, brought in like eight new systems to the hardware. So this is a great way to get even more data um, out of the system. All right, so what have we achieved today? So I thought I'd start by highlighting the, uh, the, the work that was done in the fish food experiments on Rainbow. This is the 23 qubit grid. Um, as you heard about the details of these experiments earlier today, this morning in these talks, um, we've got two of these papers submitted and three more are in preparation. And just a nice kind of uh, table to summarize all of the effort that it went into these systems. I think it's really nice to highlight, you know, even just, for example, the number of gates. I saw this in some of the chat earlier that people were very impressed with the depth and the number of gates, which is really impressive. So uh, this is really great work. What I'd like to do now is just take a moment um, and actually walk through some of the user journey here uh, for, say, the Fermi Hubbard example. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we took this case study here. Uh, and I want to give some idea of like what it, these tools look like to the NISC algorithm designer. Um, and so it's a call out to those big team effort and those who are working hard on the Fermi Hubbard specifically. Um, so a preamble here is I like to think about when, uh, you know, we have say a new experimentalist in the lab or even when you're in graduate school and you're working hard on preparing for your experiment. Um, and you've talked with your, your colleagues in simulations and you feel really good about the data that you're gonna go and take. So you've got your simulation set and you have some idea of what you're about to go do when you start twiddling knobs in the, uh, in the lab. And so you go in the lab and you start taking data. And well, it doesn't look quite like what you expect. So out of the box performance was not exactly what we thought, uh, but I do love the optimism here, right? I mean, if you look at the plot here, we're looking at uh, you know, a, a trotter steps of up to 40 and out of the box to expect that we might see uh, some signal was uh, was very optimistic. So I love that. Uh, so what we do is we look at back in our toolbox to see what else we can do to improve the data. So the first one might be to do some post selection. Uh, once we do that, it looks like things are starting to actually behave a little bit more like we expect in our simulations. Um, as uh, we learned earlier from Zhang, the, the idea here is to also look at how you can choose the qubits on the device. 
Um, and you can start to see the inhomogeneity, the, the uniqueness of each of these qubits start to arise um, when you start to do this uh, post selection across the device. Then you start to engage with some circuit averaging and things are really starting to look nice. Um, and so then uh, we have uh, the ability to apply phaser corrections and things are really starting to look good here. And then finally, as uh, Zhang noticed, uh, you take this last step to do the linear rescaling and everything starts to line up and look spectacular. So this is a really nice uh, example that I just stepped through in a few slides of kind of the, the journey that uh, one might take. Uh, I want to make note here that this was over many months that, you know, these, uh, it's these, uh, this angst was experienced. There's a lot of work that went into this, um, but it's, an, it's exciting to see the journeys. And we're really excited to see where you all come uh, on your journey on, on, on our hardware. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to, uh, to pass the mic to my favorite quantum mechanic and self-proclaimed uh, code monkey in Seattle, uh, Dave Bacon, who's going to tell you about the quantum computing service uh, in action. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dave Bacon. I'm a software engineer here at Google. Uh, and I'm excited to give you an actual demo of the quantum computing service. Uh, so, uh, so as Hartman uh, so nicely described, you know, our quantum computing service consists of the ability to write a program in CERC, uh, to send it off to our API, the quantum engine, which then schedules to run this on the processor of your choosing. Um, we've also been building a large number of open source tools over the last couple of years that I'm very proud of and that will help in that. I think there are two at the bottom that are important that you may not know about. One is ReCERC, where we put our experiments code uh, on, on, on GitHub. And then QSIM, which is a high performance simulator. And I, I hope you'll check those out uh, in your spare time. OK, so what am I going to simulate? Well, I was lucky enough last decade, uh, I mean, uh, last, you know, uh, last year, uh, to talk at the symposium. And I talked about writing NIST circuits. Uh, and in particular, uh, I talked about what I would do if I was doing my PhD thesis and I was trying to simulate some of the systems I was interested in there. And at this time, it was just simulations. So what I was talking about then uh, was this model called the compass model. So this is a, a Hamiltonian on a 2D squared grid. It's got these competing XX and ZZ interactions. And I talked about how to build a variational uh, adiabatic uh, onsots using CERC. So we, we built up this circuit. And then we sort of ran it in simulations to see how it works. And at the end of that, I sort of ended with this observation that what's nice about this Hamiltonian and the reason I was interested in it as a PhD student uh, was that there's an error correcting code in it. Uh, the stabilizer operators uh, for that code uh, commute with this Hamiltonian and the ground state is an error correcting code. And the question is, if you use post selection onto that error correcting or error detecting uh, code space, will that improve the performance of your algorithm? And in simulation, of course, I could validate this was true, but uh, we really want to run this on the actual uh, device. Uh, OK, oops. So uh, now I'm going to give a uh, demo. Uh, so I need to quickly switch over here uh, to uh, Google Colab. Um, so at this point, I have to remember to share the correct tab. And hopefully, that's switching over. Uh, Looks like I, it doesn't show up on my screen. Oh, working good. OK, so I'm going to give a demo. Here we go. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our quantum processor here. So I'm importing CERC, and I'm creating an engine object. That's the name of the object you create to access the device. And they're going to get a processor. In this case, we're getting what we call the rainbow processor. That's the one where we ran a bunch of our fish food experiments. We see the geometry of the, of the system here that we got from the service. Uh, and we see you know, these different labeled qubits, which give their location, and then the bars indicating the places where you can do two qubit interactions. OK, so since we're going to actually run something on the device, let's first find some good qubits. So here I query the engine uh, and get a, a recent calibration run. And in that calibration run, you can sort of look around. Uh, this is in particular, if you see up here, I'm getting the single qubit randomized benchmarking average error. Uh, and so I can sort of look around, and you know, like 4.1 looks like not a great qubit right now or at least at the last calibration. So I'm going to choose some other qubits. So let's see, uh, six, three, I think I filled in, still looks good. So let's actually fill that in here. We're going to pick six, three as our qubit to run it. I'm going to do the two by two compass model. So I'm just going to need four qubits. So last time I talked about building this variational onsots in CERC. So I'm sort of hiding that code elsewhere. Uh, but here you can see that circuit. Here's my four qubits. Uh, there's some sort of getting into this correct symmetry state preparation right here. And then there are these adiabatic steps. 
uh, followed by measurements at the end. Uh, the important thing here to realize is uh, uh, that one of the tricks I'm using here is that I'm doing rotations at the end to do either the, the Z or X measurement. And this is an example of using this parameter sweep where I can sort of send them both off to the surface at the same time and get back the results. The goal here is to learn these uh, adiabatic parameters, these times T. Okay, so you know if I if I have this circuit in circ like last time, you can just immediately plug it into SciPy, calculate the energy from it, uh, you know, run a bunch of simulations with sampling. So here I'm doing you know 10,000 repetitions, and you see that this thing optimizes down. The, the correct answer is minus two times the square root of two, uh, and this gets pretty close to that in simulation. But of course, what actually happens when you run it on hardware? Okay, so let's now actually run this thing on hardware. Uh, the first thing I need to do, of course, is I need to con convert this over into our data gate set. So I've sort of used some internal, uh, uh, so actually in CERC tooling to sort of do that compilation. And now you see that I have a circuit in terms of I swap, square root of I swaps here, or minus, you know, the, 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 the inverse of that. Uh, and when I do that, my gate, you know, expands a little bit. I now have depth 22 and 55 gates. Okay, so that's my circuit. Let's actually try to run that. And of course, uh, I'm going to make a little prayer to the, uh, you know, to the quantum gods that I end up in the right quantum multiverse where this quantum demo actually works. Uh, and so let's actually kick that off here. So all I need to do in order to do this in CERC is here I'm creating that circuit and I've just stuck in some random parameters. And then I get a sampler from the engine and, and this processor was rainbow. So I'm running this on the rainbow uh, system. And then I just call the sample method on it with my circuit and with these uh, parameters for the different types of measurements. Here I'm repeating it 5,000 times, and I get back a beautiful Tupandas data frame. We see the different parameters, B, for the different measurement types, and we see the bit strings that we get out, right? And so that's why the maximum of these is, is 15, right? So because we have four bits. And then from this data, I can just post-process this and get out the energy. And this was a pretty bad guess. My estimated energy was 1.7552. Okay, so last time I asked about, like, uh, you know, can post-selection uh, help you? Uh, here we see sort of what happens uh, if I run the simulation and then I do no post-selection and I use the same sort of exact optimization loop that I was using above for the simulation. And without post-selection, it gets down to about minus two, but it's pretty, you know, it does do some progress towards my objective, but it doesn't get there. Uh, okay, so now we can actually run this on, uh, on actual hardware. I'm going to use a different processor because that's where I took the original data. And it'll take a little while because SciPy likes to, make a bunch of sort of like queries before it calls back to me. Um, but we can scroll down a little bit here and I can see or show you right here the results of actually running uh, this uh, experiment. And what we see is, uh, is, that, the, uh, is that the post-selected one does indeed outperform this. Uh, and if we wait for a little bit, that'll come back. But let me switch back to the other presentation here. Uh, okay, so now we're switching back. Okay, so... Uh, it was awesome. Hopefully, everybody saw the demo and it worked. Uh, we're pro progressing through all these stages, which I think is great. Uh, we're very excited to be uh, access, you know, having our first partners running on the machines uh, in the at the end of the summer, uh, and you know, we're really excited for even more people to get access to this. And of course, everybody likes to ask, when will I get access to the machine? Uh, and I think you should stay tuned uh, tomorrow for Eric Osti. We'll have some exciting information about that. OK, so uh, thank you. This is the result of a lot of effort of a ton of people across hardware and software. Uh, this is really an incredible team to work on. I'm very lucky because I get to talk to you know, physicists, hardware engineers, software engineers, theorists all the time. And I get stuck in the middle. And it's really kind of a wonderful sort of uh, time to be in the field. Uh, and let's go check really back on that simulator really quick here to see if this worked. Share this tab instead. OK, and let's see. Oh, there it is. It's optimizing. And we see like it is making progress. Uh, and it seems to be outperforming, which is great. Like this is kind of a cool thing. Brass year, I had an idea about using this post-selection on the compass model. And this year, you know, with a little bit of coding, I can, I can sort of perform this and uh, execute this, this, this optimization. And it, and it perks. And so we're really looking forward to having this be replicated by you across the service and for you to discover lots of interesting and exciting NISC algorithms. So thank you very much. Back to you, Marissa.